What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Twilight Nine Podcast. This is episode 31. I'm your host, Riley. This week, we're talking about the players, talking about Justin Thomas, who was our pick before the tournament started. He was getting a little bit disrespected as soon as he starts creeping up into the plus 2,000 region or more than that. You want to take advantage of that, and we did, and we won. That was actually the only bet out of the six that we had uh, on the T9 card or whatever was Justin Thomas top 20. And uh, we picked JT on the podcast last week to win. So even though we only went one of six betting-wise, we hit plus 2,000. So that'll take care of the uh, little losing streak we've been on for about a couple weeks. So that covers everything plus more. So that's huge. Um, And our second winner pick out of the last month because we had Max at the Genesis also. So in the last four weeks, uh, T9's picked two winners. So that's pretty awesome. So we're looking to keep that going. Obviously, uh, we're going to shoot the shit about the players. Not a bunch of notes. Just going to talk about JT, Lee Westwood, um, Bryson played great. Little Brian Harmon played, had a really good tournament. And then the Honda Classic is this week. The field's not great. Uh, so we're not going to go crazy into depth like we've doing the last couple of weeks with the huge tournaments. It's going to be kind of just a quick little go over the course, go over the field, uh, what to watch for, key stats, all what we do normally, just we're not going to spend a bunch of time on it. And then our betting little preview early picks is going to be at the end of the show, just like every week. So let's jump into it. Let's do some headlines real quick or just some minor-ish stories. Um, Bryson DeChambeau lipped out on 18, and that lipped out, lip out cost him, I think the number was $450,000. He solo third, came in a solo third finish, and if he tied for second, he would obviously split. They add second and third and then split in a half so he would have made another half a million dollars if that putt went in so that was a bummer and then we'll get i'm going to talk about his little fiesta fiesta that happened on i don't even know what hole that was four seven i forget what hole it was it was incredible topping it all over the place slicing it all over the place we're going to get to that once we get into the uh, little round recap uh no olympics for just uh dustin johnson dj will not be at the olympics Some people understood. Some people weren't very happy about it. I saw Shambly tweeted something um, kind of on the line, if you can go to Saudi Arabia for an appearance fee and travel the world all the way across the other side of the world for $2 million for the appearance fee, you should do the same thing to represent your country in the Olympics. And I like kind of get that point of thinking, right? You think, oh, the Olympics should be a pretty big deal to these guys especially since it only happens once every four years, once every five years because of COVID, obviously. And playing for your country is obviously a huge honor. So I don't know why DJ wouldn't do it. And you have to qualify for it. So it's not just like he's going to get this opportunity again. Who knows if he's still one of the best players in the world in another four years. I mean, he probably will be. But I expected DJ to go. So we'll see who ends up being the American team. But that was a little bit disappointing. You would like to see one of the best players in the world representing America. So that was a bummer that he's not going. A um, couple other things we can talk about JT later. I have him written down on my phone. That's why I'm talking about it. But the other thing, I guess we can talk about it now because he fucking sucked and missed the cut was Rory. We talked about him last week, how he needed to, and I wrote a blog about it on twilight9.com, but we were talking about how he needed to have a really solid start at the players. He was he was making a bunch of cuts. Obviously, he missed the cut at the Genesis, but he was finishing inside pretty much the top 15 every week, top 20 every week, and he just really needed to go out at TPC Sawgrass, a place that he's won at before, had other high finishes at before, and just have a really solid start, right? Make the cut. Don't just hang around on Saturday and Sunday. Like, make a charge, be part of the conversation come Sunday afternoon. And he absolutely not, he did not do that. He missed the cut by a lot. It was never really even close, to be honest with you. He was plus three on his round on Thursday morning, heading to 18, his ninth hole of the day, puts his drive in the water, goes up, drops it on one of the front tee boxes, probably one of the ladies tee boxes or senior tee boxes, puts a four iron in the water, makes triple, I believe, or he maybe even made a quad. I honestly forget. He was like plus seven, and then he just never played good golf coming into that. I mean, on on Friday, it looked like he might have made a little bit of a charge. He 
took the turn and then made like two or three birdies in a row and then he just made bogeys coming in and it was just a shit show. But anyway, he came out and said on Friday after his round that he's not very comfortable with swings at and he blamed it or he put it on, I guess. I wouldn't say he blamed it on. Chasing distance, chasing Bryson. He admitted, and it, it was funny during the interview, you can tell that he really thought about it. He was he didn't talk for 20 seconds. He had his mouth kind of open. He was like, do I want to say this? Do I not want to say this? But he eventually blamed it on the chase for distance. What Bryson did at Wingfoot really impacted the way Rory was going to approach this upcoming golf season. His swing got longer. It got flatter. He increased club head speed. He's hitting the ball much further than he used to about a year ago. But it kind of killed his golf swing. The consistency went down. It's too long of a swing now. So he was saying in the presser that he is going to go back. He's took, he's not at the Honda. He's not in Palm Beach Gardens. He's going to take a week or two and just kind of dial it back, rein it in, and see if he can kind of get back to the way he was swinging it middle of last year because that's when he said he was happy with the swing. Everything looked pretty good throughout 2020 and even obviously in 2019. His swing was in great shape. And that's what he's going to try to go back to. So hopefully a couple weeks off is good for Rory. Um, the putter seems to be okay. It's just going to be about the golf swing. His driver needs to get better. His irons seem to get better. His I can't tell you how bad his iron play was at the players. It was awful. He was missing wedges by 30 yards when he had wedges and pitching wedges in his hand. Like It was really bad. So hopefully he can get it figured out. And it, that's, why, that's why the media, and he's one of the most popular players, in the world is just because he's that honest when it comes to the media. It's crazy how honest that dude is. He is one of the very few guys that would sit up there and be like, another player on tour influenced my golf game so much that it was a bad thing. His swing got worse over the last eight months. So I'm looking forward to seeing him back in a couple weeks. I think he's the next tournament he's playing in is the match play. I'm pretty sure that's the next time we're going to see him. So hopefully his swing looks more 2019-esque when he was just... I mean, he's one of the longest players on tour anyway. He doesn't need that extra 10 yards to try to catch up with Bryson. He still averages... I mean, he's second or third on the tour this season in strokes gained off the tee. And he's still hitting a a very, very long way. If he reins it in just a little bit, it's not going to be that bad. I mean, he was winning golf tournaments before a couple years ago, just not doing this. So I'm not too worried about it. And obviously, Bryson's just like any other golfer. Sure, he hits it a mile. But other parts in his game aren't going to be crazy good every single week they like they have been over the last two weeks. He's like any golfer. He's going to have bad weeks. So that margin of distance, like the distance between Rory and Bryson, if Rory like reined it in a little bit, like isn't that going to be that big of a deal? I don't feel like so. We'll see. I'm really excited to watch him at the match play. Hopefully he gets his game together a little bit. But that's it. I was going to talk about that later than the players, but I'm going to talk about the players now. And Justin Thomas, he was money. The kid, he's had so much shit happen to him over the last two months. It's been awful. Obviously, he had the slur thing go on. He was dropped by his big sponsorship he came out and apologized everybody pretty much in the media on tours like that's not who justin thomas is he doesn't really he doesn't do that stuff he's a good guy blah 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 and it was kind of just a one-off thing lost sponsorships he was getting hammered on twitter hammered on social media um that he should lose everything blah 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 suspended on tour it was just a really shitty situation and then Sunday at the Waste Management Phoenix Open, he loses his grandfather right before his round. I still don't know how he played golf that day. He even said it yesterday that he only played just because that's what his grandfather would want him to do. But I don't know how he played that round of golf. And then it, that kind of just stuck with him for a bit, and he didn't play great golf. He missed the cut at the Genesis. And then after missing the cut at the Genesis a couple days later, his best buddy, Tiger Woods, gets in that terrible car accident. So it's been a really emotional couple of months for Justin Thomas and he was just looking for something good to happen and that was this week I think he made the cut I think he was two under maybe going into the weekend I forget just because I was tracking him a little bit because we bet him top 20 so I wanted him to hang around for the weekend obviously to try to make a run and that's exactly what he did he make a fuck ton of birdies on Saturday went absolutely low and he's the guy on tour that can do that it seems like every time he barely misses the cut he shoots that round on Sunday to get him back up into contention, and that was what happened this weekend. And he was just absolutely locked in. His ball striking was phenomenal. The putter got hot. He chipped in from like 70 feet. He just had one of those Justin Thomas-esque rounds where it's just like, holy shit, this is the best player in the world when he gets this hot. And then Sunday, 
starts off really slow. I think within the first seven holes, I think he missed at least three or four putts inside of 15 feet for birdie, maybe inside 20 feet. He was just couldn't get the lid off of the hole on the front on the front nine on Sunday. And then he bogeyed, I believe it was what eight he bogeyed eight three putt and then he went to the par five ninth hit a bomb hit a ridiculous draw around the trees to about 24 feet and made birdie so he made the turn at even for the day which is a good step because you know on that backside of tbc sawgrass you can really go low there's a lot of holes that you can birdie going in and then he played his first four holes on the back nine at five under he went birdie eagle birdie birdie Insane golf, really, really fucking good. And that's when Westwood and Bryson just stopped doing anything. I mean, they both didn't play that great yesterday, but they weren't going anywhere. So it was going to end up being somebody to come up from behind, and JT was the guy. And especially when JT starts feeling it with the putter, it's fucking over. He starts doing that little cocky cocky walk. He's, he's spinning clubs all over the goddamn place. He was spinning irons everywhere, twirling them everywhere. And that's when you get cocky Justin Thomas, and it was incredible to watch. That's what you're there for with JT. And the one thing that I'm not going to get too much into it, but the the one thing that really impressed me with Justin Thomas, and that that's pretty much what I saw all over golf Twitter on Sunday afternoon, was his ability to shape the golf ball is fucking ridiculous how he can do that. Uh, Shane Bacon was tweeting about it. A couple other guys were tweeting about it. But his how he played the 16th hole and he hit a couple of those uh, throughout the week, his little stinger hook, draw toe, draw things or whatever that only fly like two thirty and then run out the way that he played the 16th hole at Sawgrass. I don't know if anybody else in the world could play it like that. Maybe like tiger back in the day, he hit a stinging hook draw off the, t- I don't want to say it's off the toe, but he, that carried, 230 perfectly in the middle of the fairway ran out 60 yards and then on the very next shot on his approach into the green he hit a choke down high cut five wood to the center of the green I don't know if people anybody else on tour could go back to back shots like that like you nobody else has a 40 40 foot high hook draw off the tee and then immediately when they get to the fairway hit a towering high cut with a choke down five wood that is ridiculous talent and when that is combined with the way he was putting the golf ball you're not going to beat justin thomas and i was and i was on golf twitter and getting it into you know with a couple people and the discussion is in golf media and pretty much the golf world is when guys are in full flight who's the best player in the world and the two guys that are normally mentioned is Dustin Johnson and Rory McIlroy those are the two guys that you think these are the two best players in the world when everything is going their way and they're absolutely in full flight hitting fairways hitting greens and making putts I think it's Justin Thomas watching him at the players in absolute full flight hitting every fairway having all of the shots and then also putting the lights out he could have shot 10 under yesterday with that front nine Nothing was going in. And then as soon as the as soon as that light came on with the putter, I don't know if there's anybody better in the world than Justin Thomas when an absolute full flight. It is incredible to watch. 17 pressure hits it to the left side of the green. Hits pretty much as good as a putt as you can. He keeps it on the green. That's a terrible putt left to right, about 10 feet. And then it runs by. I think he had a little six-footer up the hill. He makes it. And then 18, he does the hook draw again, which I don't – he did it on Saturday. And I'm like, man, that's kind of ballsy. This one was even worse. He aimed like right of the trees that line up on the 18th fairway down the right side. He hook toe drawed it. He's standing there like, holy shit, that went in the water. It ends up not. It hits the ground and somehow like kicks kind of right and then goes down the fairway. It was one of the best tee shots I've ever seen. It was so sick. It was definitely by accident, but it was electric. The tracers that he was producing on Sunday was incredible. And then he hits a really nice approach shot, little dead arm wedge, I think, or nine iron probably to the front of the green and two putts and wins. And that's, that was pretty much over just because Lee and Bryson, I think both needed the whole, or Lee needed to pull out on 18 to tie. So it was pretty much over after that, but, Justin Thomas, man, he's so fucking sick, and he's so cool. His speech at the end after was awesome. Um, It was a little rough that they had to – I mean, I'm sure they had to, but they asked about his grandfather. Obviously, he got emotion about it. But he was our pick to win. 
And yeah, it always felt like Justin Thomas on a Pete Dye course was going to win Sawgrass eventually. I think he's probably going to win more there. I think he'll be a multi time player champion, but it fit well too, way too good. His value was there. And yeah, Justin Thomas was the easy pick for me last week and we capitalized plus 2000 on JT. So that's sick. Yeah. He just played phenomenal. So did Westwood. He did. He played so well. And Sunday early was tough. And then once he was kind of out of the lead, he was like, oh shit, I need to kind of kick it back on. And then he played really well. He was making putts. He birdied uh, what is that? 15. He birdied 15 after JT bogeyed 15 with a three putt. So he was right there. And then he was in the mix and obviously he's going to be in the mix. He was the lead. He led by two before the round started, but even after everything went so shitty, his bunker play was terrible all day long. And after everything that went so shitty earlier in the round, he still made birdies at the end of the round to kind of get back up there. And he's playing phenomenal golf right now. We're going to talk about him going into the Honda just because he's going to, he's one of the favorites, I think for the Honda, just because he has played very well there in the past. But his level of golf is really good. And he seems very relaxed. Like even when he was making bogeys and he fell out of the lead, he was still smiling with his fiance who's on the bag. And I guess, and I didn't know that she's a sports psychologist. I think that's what they said on the broadcast. So that's kind of sick having one of those on the bag caddying for you during a PGA tour event, just because that's just ease the mind, man. But he looks really good. We'll see if his play continues. Um, his, I mean, his I don't even remember what hole that was. But this is the fourth hole, seventh hole. I don't remember what the fuck hole that was. I'm going to look it up right now before I start talking about it. But we got to talk about him and Bryson on that hole. And it was one of the one of the funniest things I've seen on a PG at a PJ Tour event during during a broadcast. You see, you know, a bad shot every once in a while, but Sunday at the players within 30 minutes, shit just was happening. Brandon Todd on 17 shanks it on the island green and almost hits the other island green that has all the yellow flowers on it one of the worst shots i've ever seen on 17 and he was laughing obviously you gotta laugh at the bad ones but what happened with these guys was incredible so that happened and then bryson and lee step up to i don't even know what hole it was but (sighs) it was one of the it was so funny because i was on the couch and i'm watching it i'm like damn bryson doesn't look very comfortable with that golf ball i don't know if it was like stance was a little bit different that time or if he was a little further away from the ball or he wasn't hovering the club like normal but it's it looked really awkward and then he just dead tops the living shit out of it into the water that's about what 80 yards in front of him and he's looking at the club blaming the club which i love it that's i was living in a dream when bryson was just cracking um he was blaming the club which is hilarious i've done that but it was incredible. And then Lee, who watched it happen, that's not a great message and picture in your head. He stands up and hits one of the biggest banana slices I've ever seen a PGA Tour player hit into the water that doesn't get to the other side of the water at all, not even close. But he takes the drop on the other side of the water. Very cavalier drop. I don't know how anybody didn't stop that they even talked to the tv people before he took the drop i don't know how anybody thinks that's where you're supposed to take that drop he should have been on the other side of the water which maybe he can't even go for the green at that point because i think lee only made bogey i think but and then bryson drops it on the tee box uh in front of the water and hits an absolute block hosel adjacent shot that goes 60 yards right of where he's wanting in the shit he tries punching out doesn't get all the way out and then he hits it on the green and then i think makes the putt actually for double bogey but that 25 minute stretch at the players was one of the funniest shit i've ever seen it was like giving a playing lesson with somebody that's never played golf before that's how bad it was for like half an hour and it was amazing you don't really see that at a PGA tour event ever. And to see them struggle like that and look like you on the back nine of your, like your Saturday morning round, it was amazing. I loved every second of it. So that was that we had to bring that up just because it was fucking awesome. But yeah, that's pretty much for the, that's pretty much it for the players. A lot of guys were playing good golf. Um, Brian Harmon have to talk about him. He was nails down the stretch. He was playing fantastic golf. He was making par putts when he needed to, 
I think that was 15 or 14. He made a, a great par putt, and he was just kind of hanging around. He was just playing very, very good golf, hitting fairways, hitting greens. When he's when his putter's on, he's a pretty d- good putter. When it's not, he's a very, very, very bad putter. But, yeah, he tied for third with Bryson. Uh, Taylor Gooch had a fantastic Sunday. He shot 67-5 under, one of the best rounds, actually, of the day. Corey Connors made a charge. He was 6 under. 10 under for the tournament. Paul Casey snuck in the top five um, after a two under on Saturday. Shane Lowry, who I'm going to talk about uh, coming up here for the Honda Classic, also had a good week with solo eighth. But going into the weekend, the leaderboard was kind of dry, like not a bunch of big names. And then Justin Thomas made a run on Saturday. Bryson was up there. John Rahm made a run on Sunday. He ended up kind of falling down the leaderboard a little bit. but And by a little bit, I mean he's still top 10. But just a lot of guys... Big names ended up at the top of the leaderboard. Sergio, uh, Matty Fitzpatrick, John Rahm, and then a bunch of guys missed the fucking cut. Rory, Tommy Fleetwood, Ricky Fowler, Xander Shoffley, which I did not expect him to miss the cut. I thought he was going to be money at Sawgrass because his game is just so complete, but he played like shit. A lot of guys, Dustin Johnson also didn't play that well. So it was a very polarizing event. Some It was crazy how much the leaderboard was spread out. Usually at the players, the best players in the world That's where they perform, and they just did not happen this year. But fantastic golf tournament. Loved it. Sunday was absolutely amazing. We've been spoiled with finishes for the last couple months. It's insane how golf, how good golf has been so far this season. So hopefully that continues this week at the Honda. I'm not sure it's going to. The field's not great. Like I said, before we get into the Honda, we only hit two bets. One was Justin Thomas top 20, and the other one was Justin Thomas for the win plus 2,000. So we're going to take that. I'll take the minus whatever four point whatever units and make up for it with 20 units from the JT win. So we're going to take that. But let me put my glasses on. Let's get into the Honda Classic here. I can't see my computer for people watching on YouTube. I can't see my computer without my glasses, so we're going to get into it. All right. We're looking to pick another winner, folks. I really want to keep this stretch going. Pick three out of five. That would be the best stretch of my my uh, PGA Tour betting career. I think I had Neiman um, win the Green by Green Briar, whatever they call it. I think it, that was in 2019. And then I had actually in the playoffs a couple of years ago, I had Rory and JT in back to back weeks, so that was pretty cool. But two out of four, we're looking for three out of five. So let's see. Hopefully the Honda delivers. The field's not great. Sung J.M. is back as the defending champion and is in good form. Only one finish outside the top 30 since the American Express, and that was a T32 at the Farmers. The rest of the field isn't great. Uh, Neiman's going to be there. Lee Westwood, Daniel Berger, Adam Scott, Gary Woodland, Shane Lowry, Phil Mickelson, Ricky Fowler. Like none of those top, top guys are going to be here, but it's enough to probably turn on the TV. So the course pj national is a par 70 7100 yards bermuda greens and the course if you guys follow the pga tour at all which i assume you do if you listen to this podcast is famous for the street the three hole stretch called the bear trap named after the redesigner jack nicholas uh, the bear trap features two par threes and a par four with water in play on every single shot that's where the tournament comes down to on sunday afternoon if you can get through the bear trap at even par on sunday and you're in contention you're probably going to gain strokes on the field that's where you need to make your money on sunday afternoon is those three out of the last four holes you need to get it done on that stretch uh the weather is going to be nice it's going to be hot at least on thursday 88 partly cloudy 19 percent chance of rain and it is going to be windy man 18 miles an hour it's actually pretty windy all week friday is 87 scattered thunderstorms 45 percent chance of rain the winds at 13 saturday's 80 partly cloudy no rain and nine mile an hour winds and then sunday is going to be 78 with a.m showers so luckily that doesn't really I mean, it's unless it's bad enough to push everything back. AM showers doesn't really influence the tournament just because the leaders tee off in the afternoon, so that shouldn't matter. 36% chance of rain and the wind's at 13. So it's going to be blowing, so that's kind of what we're going to be looking for, really good iron play, and that's kind of what you need at this golf course. Uh, key stats. So I mentioned it last week on the show, or at least maybe two weeks ago, but starting to look at this new thing on uh, data golf and it's the variation. So they do this thing where they take this uh, four strokes gain categories, putting approach around the green and off the tee. And they look at the field of each tournament the year before and pretty much the event average of all time since they've been doing strokes gained and they figure out which strokes gain category causes the most variation in scores throughout the field, right? So this week at PGA national in 2020, the biggest category that 
affected scoring in the variation of scores was approach play. So it was uh, 40%. The event average is right around 40% compared to the tour average at 34% at 34.7% actually. So iron play is more important at PGA national for the Honda classic compared to the average tour event. So that's where we're going to be looking for. And it's really all about greens and regulation on tour last season, this golf course ranked third, most difficult to find the green of regulation. So that's where the critical iron play comes in. Uh, like I said, every single week, iron play is very important, but at PGA national, you need to find greens of regulation to have success here. And of course, 40% to the tour average of 30, 4.7%. You need to have good strokes and approach numbers to win at this golf course. And then the other thing is going to be around the green. Um, when players miss these greens, they fail to get up and down 42% of the time, which ranks 14th hardest on tour. So when you miss these greens, they're very hard to chip from the Bermuda grass, very, very difficult runoff areas, thick, rough. The bunker complexes are fantastic. So the guys that bring their short game when they miss greens of regulation are going to um, gain strokes on the field just because it's so difficult around the greens. So when you have the guys with really good hands with really good short games, they have an advantage around this place, especially when you can pair that with really good iron play. So data golf information, course fit. Number one is grand, grand reserve country club. Number two is TPC Louisiana. And number three is TPC Summerlin trending of the players in the field. Daniel Berger's number one, his last three starts are a win, a T 35 and a T nine. Number two is Joaquin Neiman with a T-43, T-28, and a T-29. And then number three is the defending champion, Sung J M at T-28, T-21, and T-17. So he's definitely trending in the right direction. Uh, percent chance to win, baseline, course history, course fit, all that kind of stuff. You guys know the drill. Number one is Daniel Berger, 8.4%. Number two is Sung J M at 5.3%. And number three is Joaquin Neiman at 4.5%. Betting odds. Daniel Berger is... This week's favorite at plus 1050. Sung Jae Im's behind him at 13. And then the next guy's already 2,000. Neiman's 2,000. Uh, Westwood's 2,200. Russell Henley's up there. That's when you know the field is not very strong, is when Russell Henley is your fifth favorite. That's not a great sign for the field. Russell Henley's at three. Adam Scott's at plus 3,000. Taylor Gooch is at 35. Shane Lowry's at 35. Keegan Bradley's at four. Tringali's at four. Cameron Davis, the Aussies at 45. Zach Johnson. Maybe the most, but I watched him a little bit at the Arnold Palmer. Has to be the most boring golfer, maybe of all time. It's insane. Holy shit, his game's so boring. But, I mean, the guy, he's won two majors. And they're probably at the two coolest places you could win a major. So, got to respect that. And then Chris Kirk's at five also. So, let's get into the card. Let's get talk a little bit about betting here. That's what we're here for. So, again, we were only one of six last week. At the players, but that doesn't really matter because we won Justin Thomas plus 2,000 and won a bunch of units. So let's try to do that again. Let's, you know, try to win more bets than last week for sure. But let's just try to pick the winner also because why not? And we're going to start with JT Poston. He missed a cut at his uh, first events of 2021. Since then, he's made all but one and has three top 25 finishes. T18 at the Farmers, T11 at the Waste Management, T22 at the Players. He was getting some Sunday uh, coverage at the at the Players his swing looks really good, actually. That's when I kind of started looking into him, how he's doing this week. His strokes gained. Uh, T degree number this season is just really bad. He ranks 160th on tour, but he's sixth in strokes ain't putting. And that's important because last year, the greens at PGA National were the 10th easiest on tour to putt on. So in theory, right, you take a guy that can really fucking roll the rock and you put him on easy greens, he should make a lot of putts this week. He's made the cut in, at all of his at all of his appearances at the Honda, excuse me, with finishes of T35, T36, and T27. And he's currently plus 7,000 a win. And I always usually like to target at these smaller events, guys right around that range, um, just because the guys at the top that might be favorites, like they're not really that f much favorites, right? When Russell Henley's your fifth favorite, that's tough to like, oh yeah, be really confident that Russell Henley's gonna win a fucking golf tournament. So I like to go down the little leaderboard just a little bit, guys, who have been playing well recently, and Poston has. He's been playing very good golf um, in the last two months-ish and has played decently well enough at the Honda, especially with a top 30 finish and nothing outside the top 40, that you think if he gets hot with the putter, 
he's gonna he's gonna be up there at the top of the leaderboard. He's a good ball striker, obviously can roll it. So I like JT posting this week. I'm not a hundred percent sure where I'm gonna put him. Um, DraftKings, the last time I checked, I'm going to refresh uh, the website right now. The last time, I, oh no, they got him. So top 30 is probably where I'm going to end up putting him. And he is at plus one, yeah, plus 175 for a top 30. That's probably where I'm going to put JT. Um, he's playing good golf. Obviously, he's a, he's a good enough ball striker to get it done in the wind if the wind picks up at PJ National, which it looks like it's going to. So I like posting this week a lot. Uh, plus, 175 for a top 30 is probably going to be the play. If you guys don't trust that enough and go to a top 40, you can get him at plus 110. So he's still plus money for a top 40. He's never finished outside the top 40 at this event. So that's a little bit safer of a bet. If you want to go there, I'll probably end up going top 30. Uh, the next guy that we're going to talk about is Lee Westwood. It's kind of tough to leave him off in this section just because of the golf that he's playing right now. It's pretty ridiculous what he's doing this little stretch that he's on, and he's going to be a very, very popular name this week. When you guys are reading your different betting articles going into the week, he's going to be very popular. Just because of his recent form, obviously, back-to-back uh, solo runner-up finishes. But over the years, he has loved PJ National. In his last 24 rounds at the Honda, he's first in strokes gained tee to green and first in strokes gained total. Going back to 2010, he's played in this event seven times, has made the cut every single time, and finished inside the top 10 four times, including a top five last season. The one thing you get a little bit nervous about is the dude's 47 fucking years old. He's an old guy. He's almost old enough to go on the Champions Tour. Playing high-level golf three weeks in a row is tough. I mean, it's nice that the weather's warm and it keeps everything loose and they don't really have to travel that much, right? They were in Orlando, then they go up to Ponte Vedra, and then they go just down the same coast to Palm Beach Gardens. So it's not that much travel, which is nice for Lee. It's very hard to play high-level golf pretty much at any age three weeks in a row. So we're going to see how the old man holds up. But he is going to be a very popular pick this week at the Honda. If you go over to – it's actually pretty funny. If you go over to top 20s, they changed M, which I get. The first time I looked at this, M was actually plus money for a top 20. But Westwood is plus 150 for a top 20. So if you like that recent form, great history at this golf course, that might be a great bet. He's going to be minus money for a top 30. Uh, but top 20 might be a solid bet for that plus 150 for Lee Westwood, the old man. Uh, next one's going to be the defending champion, Sung J.M. Just I bring this up every time that we talk about a Florida golf tournament the last month is just because he loves Florida, man. He fucking loves the Sunshine State. Since 2018, he has started nine tournaments in Florida. He has four top five finishes. Loves this place. Uh, his iron play really struggled at the players. But on the other hand, in every other aspect, he was solid. He was second off the tee and seventh in putting. His ball striking is usually fantastic, so I don't really expect his iron play to struggle two weeks in a row. So even if he's like middle of the pack, like top 40 strokes gained in iron play, he's probably going to be at the top of the leaderboard again. He's going to make a run, especially if his driver and putter stay there. The putter I expect to just because these greens are easier compared to the tour average and you need to hit fairways around this place. So that's going to be a huge advantage if he's hitting the driver really well like he did at the players. He's minus money now for a top 20. So if you like him, you can get him at plus 185 for a top 10, which I think is great value for a guy trending in the right direction. Top 20 at the players won this event last year. I think a top 10 is very doable for Sungjae. He's definitely trending in the right direction. He's hovering around top 20 pretty much every week. He's either one shot inside it or one shot outside it. If you like him at a place that he's won before, especially in the form that he's in, I think plus 185 is great value. That probably will end up being on the T9 card on uh, Wednesday. Next guy is actually a guy that I just made fun of for being the fifth favorite, but what we are going to talk about, Russell Henley. He has improved his finish here the last three years. T21 and T24 rather in 2018, T20 in 2019, and he had a top 10 last season. He's always one of the best iron players on tour, and he is this season just again. He's just a fucking incredible ball striker. He's sixth in strokes gain approach. He missed the cut at the players, but each of the last two years, Russell has missed had missed a cut two weeks before the Honda, and his finishes have been great. The schedule usually, I think he had the Genesis in between the Honda. Because the Honda usually kicks off the Florida swing, so they go from Riviera to the Honda. But the last two years, he missed a cut. Then he started at the Genesis. Then he started and had a great start at the at the Honda Classic. So I'm not that concerned that he missed the cut at the players. That's a fucking tough golf course. I think this is a place where he's trending. 
and he had a couple like solid finishes like early in 2021. So I think I wouldn't bet him top 10. I would probably hover somewhere in the top 20 range for Russell Henley. You can get him at plus 163 for a top 20, which I think is really good value. He's even plus money. He's even money for a top 30. You could bet that. Uh, he'll probably be on the card just because of his uh, iron ability. He's a fantastic iron player. So watch out for him also on Wednesday. If he if he makes the cut, I could see him making a run at this golf tournament. Uh, the next guy, Taylor Gooch. He's made his last two cuts at this event, including a top 20 back in 2019. Last week at the Players, Gooch tied for fifth, which was huge. He was fourth in strokes gained approach, 10th tee to green, and all of that is very necessary at PGA National. If you can keep that iron play up along with that driver, He's going to be money. He struggles a little bit with the driver. He's only eclipsed the 50% mark in fairways and regulation once in his last five starts. That can't happen at PGA National. You need to hit fairways, and you need to hit a lot of them to contend there. So he need to, he's going to need to turn that around for sure. Um, but luckily, these, these fairways are actually easier to hit than the tour average. So he can have a little bit of bounce back week with the driver. And then with the putter, he's a little hot and cold with the putter. But again, these greens are a little bit easier than tour average. So that kind of highlights what Gooch is doing. We'll see. The last couple of times he's had a high finish, the next week hasn't been as great. Like he hasn't kept form consistently. So I don't know if he's eventually going to go on the card. But for a top 20 for Gooch, you can get him at plus 175. So there's just going to be a lot of value for top 20s this week. I mean, Neiman is fucking plus 138 for a top 20 at this event with nobody in it. That might have to auto go on the card. He made the cut at the players and played okay. So we'll see. The next guy was the guy that actually watched Justin Thomas's win uh, close up and personal and fucking peed down his leg, and that's Doug Gim. His putting struggled the last two weeks, but the easier greens at PGA National should help break the slump, hopefully. I'm kind of hoping that with a couple of guys. Um, he was 12th in strokes gained tee to green at the players and, and hit nearly 80% of the greens, which is huge because that's one of the key stats for this week at PGA National. You need to hit a bunch of greens. The last two stun Sundays for him have been absolute nightmares. He shot 81 at the API and 78 at the players. With the field being a little bit weaker, he may feel a little bit more comfortable on Sunday if he gets into the mix mix again, right? You're not staring down at Justin Thomas, a Bryson DeChambeau, a West, uh, Lee Westwood, unless I guess Lee is in contention again at the Honda, but he's going to be staring down, say he's like three back and he's staring down like Russell Henley. Like he's going to be a little bit more comfortable than trying to go chase JT. But we'll see. He misses. He missed the cut here last year in Palm Beach. So we'll see if Gim can bounce back. He's just playing really good golf. His finishes do not reflect the golf that he's playing, right? I think he, what, T20 something and T30 something of the players. That doesn't reflect how good that guy's playing right now. I mean, he was tied for, what, fifth heading into the round at the players. So he's playing good golf. I expect that to carry over more than his missed cut last year. I like form instead of history. Another weird one, Brandon Wu. This is when, when you start talking about fucking Brandon Wu, that's when you know the field is just not that great. That's when you know. Uh, he's one of the best players on the Corn Ferry uh, Tour, though. He made a start in the PGA Tour a few weeks ago in Puerto Rico, the week of the WGC workday where they're at concession, and he finished in the top 10 T7. He hit 72% of fairways in windy conditions, which he'll need to do again this week if the wind picks up. He's made nine starts in the PGA Tour. He has three missed cuts, but two of those missed cuts were at major. So he's kind of looking for his first really good start on the PGA Tour, and that might happen this week just because he's a really good iron player. He can putt it pretty well, and that's what you're going to need to do. And he can hit fairways. So if he hits a bunch of greens, Brandon Wu, could I don't know if he's going to be in the mix to win, but I like him probably for a top 40. You could probably get him for plus value for a top 40. Let me go down. He's kind of in the JT posting range. Yeah, so he's plus 110 for a top 40. If you're going to go woo at some point, I would go 40. I don't think I would go 30, even though the value is going to be a little bit better there for obvious reasons. I don't know if I trust him that much, but for a top 40, I like that. He usually hovers when he makes starts on the PGA Tour. He usually hovers when he makes a cut right around 40, 50. That's the bet on woo if you're going to hit him. Two more guys, uh, Shane Lowry. He finished solo eighth at the players. He was 24th in strokes gained approach. On the year, he's 34th strokes gained tee to green. That's huge, but his putting's terrible. He's 148 on tour when it comes to strokes gained putting. But again, with these easier greens at PGA National, it should be a better week on the greens for Shane. They're just not that hard. So if you find him in regulation, a lot of flat putts for birdie, that's where Shane's going to need to go. And especially... If the wind picks up in Florida over the weekend, which it looks like it's going to forecasted right now, Lowry is one of the better wind players on the PGA Tour. 
I mean, you saw it on Sunday, the players. The dude just grinds and is very, very good in the wind. You can't beat those Euro Tour guys, so Lowry's always a good bet when the wind picks up. And he plays T21 here last year. So if you can get him for a top 20, top 30, uh, let me see what his value is for a top 20 real quick. You can get Shane Lowry, yeah, plus 188 for a top 20, and he's plus 110 for a top 30. So I think plus 188 is probably where I'm going to go because that's crazy value. The dude's playing really good golf, and he finished right around there last year. Top 20 for a Shane Lowry is probably going to go on the card later this week. And then the last guy we're going to talk about before we get out of here is Brendan Steele. Incredible, solid start to 2021. He's kind of flying under the radar just a little bit. He was a little bit on the coverage on Sunday at the players. He's only finished outside the top 40 twice, and he had a top five at the Sony. He had a top 15 at this event back in 2017 and finished in the top five here last season. On the year, he's 50th strokes gained tee to green, very solid, but has struggled on the greens. But again, on these easier greens at PGA National, you can turn the putter around and make more birdies. If he strikes the ball well and he hits a bunch of fairways, I think his solid season season will continue in Palm Beach Gardens. I think he could have a very good week. Brandon Steele, he could contend. If you guys are looking, Jeff Kings real quick for top 20. He was actually pretty far down the le- um, this list. I think he's either under like woo and stuff because I was looking for value at the bottom. And let's see if I can find him. It's crazy how far fucking this guy is down this list right now. I can't even find him unless I'm missing him. But yeah, I think, oh no, Steele's right there. Plus 4,500, plus 550 for a top 10. So he's going to be plus money for a top 30 for sure. Um, I don't know why I can't find him right now. But yeah, so that's probably going to be a direction that I go with just because I think he's had such a solid start to his season. I think that continues, especially if, the putter on an easier surface gets hot. He's plus 125 for a top 30. I think that's probably where I'll go with steel. But that's it, guys. That's what we're thinking so far for the Honda Classic. Hopefully, this tournament's good. We've been very spoiled recently with these tournaments are just insane. The players was fantastic. Had JT to win. Um, Wednesday is when you guys will get all the official betting stuff. The article will come out some point on Wednesday, probably mid to late morning. And then the video will come out that night on YouTube and my Instagram and all that kind of stuff. Follow the show Instagram at Twilight9Pod. Send in your questions. Send in your picks if you want to be featured maybe on the page, maybe a little IG story um, mention or whatever with your picks for the week. My personal Instagram is at Riley Hamill underscore and the weather in Massachusetts is finally getting a little bit better up here. And next week it's going to be, I think actually at the end of this week, we're looking at like 50 and 60 degree days. So instructional content will be coming to the YouTube channel. Probably next week will be the first instructional video. So you guys will have that to look forward to, which is pretty sick. And then starting officially, this is the official word now starting at, Matt on master's week that Friday, we're going to be doing two episodes a week. So it's going to be a Friday, like morning to like 12 or one o'clock record while watching the golf tournament. It's going to be a little weekend preview of who I think live bet for the weekend, who looks the best, who can make a charge on Saturday, that kind of thing. So that's starting on master's week. Just thought I'd give you a heads up. And one of my buddies is going to be joining me for that. So that's awesome. But yeah, guys, that's it. Enjoy the Honda classic. And I will talk to you guys next week.